And it's this, this construct then, both the labrum and the anterior band together, that uh, form the essential lesion or the bank heart lesion we know about. The long head of the biceps attaches to the superior labrum, and that also is a weak link because that's where we have slap tears occur. Now, if you have a slap tear or you're fixing a bank heart that goes from 12 to 3 o'clock, you better think twice because that's a normal area where you can have a normal uh, capsular sublabel foramen that has devoid of uh, any pathology. And so the area between noon and 3 o'clock is often a normal variant, and so you shouldn't be fixing slap tears in that area. How about the joints other than the glenohumeral joints? Well, we have the sternoclavicular joints. It's a gliding joint. We have the acromioclavicular joint that is, a, that is composed of both the acromioclavicular and the coracoclavicular ligaments. The coracoclavicular ligaments, the coronoid and the trapezoid. Now keep in mind that the acromioclavicular joint is important to prevent horizontal or front back movement of the AC joint. And that's why we try to preserve this when we're doing arthroscopic distal clavicle resections, is to try to, re uh, to preserve that top tissue, that white tissue on the top after you remove the bone. The coracoclavicular ligaments, of course, prevent vertical migration of the clavicle. That's why we try to repair those in grade 5 AC separations. And we try to reconstruct them with Weaver Dunn operations because that presents vertical migration of the clavicle. The scapulothoracic joint is another joint that's a gliding joint. And it uh, goes from ribs 2 through 7, and it's involved in abduction at a 2 to 1 ratio with the glenohumeral joint. So the glenohumeral joint does 120 degrees, the scapulothoracic does 60 degrees, 2 to 1 ratio. And that's frequently asked on test questions. What are, well, we know the static restraints then are the articular congruity, the negative intraarticular pressure, and what that means is if you take a uh, leaven blade and poke it into the capsule, the humeral head will sublux inferiorly. That's because there's a negative intraarticular pressure that maintains the glenohumeral orientation. It's the same reason when you have a fracture sometimes you'll see that the humerus depresses inferiorly. That's because the pressure has been released. The other static constraint we've already been over is the glenohumeral ligaments. There are also dynamic restraints, and this includes primarily the rotator cuff muscles. Also, there's two concepts called a joint compression effect and a barrier effect, which allows dynamic restraint as well. No lecture on the shoulder or elbow would be complete without a discussion of the throwing athlete and the phases of throwing. These include wind-up, early and late cocking, acceleration, and follow-through. The most important thing is to realize the disease processes associated with those phases of throwing. The late cocking phase is associated with internal impingement. What's internal impingement? Well, that's the throwing arm problem we have now that consists of posterior glenoid tightness and partial cuff tears and perhaps even glenohumeral internal rotation defects or GERD. And so this is an area of recent interest that's become a focus of a lot of problems in the shoulder. The other thing to recognize is the follow-through phase. The follow-through phase stresses the posterior capsule. It's also been showed, associated with slap tears, and so that can cause slap tears. There's a high torque during the follow-through phase. The key when you're looking at shoulder patients is to consider several factors in the basic history. One of those is the age. Younger patients have instability. Older patients may have rotator cuff disease or fractures or arthritis. The other issue is the mechanism of injury. If you have a direct blow or fall onto that shoulder, you may have an AC injury. If you have an abduction external rotation injury, you may have had a shoulder instability episode. If you have night pain, maybe you have a rotator cuff tear in the older patients. If you're a weightlifter, then very commonly you may have osteolysis of the distal clavicle, or weightlifters can have pectoralis ruptures. How about the physical examination? Well, it's the old hop and fill approach of observation and then examination. And so look first, look for prominence, weaning, dislocations, AC separation. Then do your provocative maneuvers, impingement, apprehension time tests, after you do your range of motion as well. Strength testing is important as well. And here we're looking at rotator cuff strength. So look at strength with the super, supraspinatus for, by resisted abduction, infraspinatus, resisted external rotation, subscapularis, resisted internal rotation, 
or on subscapularis, the thing that's answered asked the most on test questions is the so-called liftoff sign with the arm behind the back and the hand be kept away from the buttocks with resistance. And that, that is a classic test for subscapularis weakness. Then you do your more uh, specific examinations for disease-specific areas. For example, apprehension, abduction, external rotation of the arm will cause an apprehension of the patient who has instability, anterior instability. Relocation, you push down on that same arm that you were doing the apprehension test on and the patient gets relief. There's another little test you can do by releasing that relocation and they can surprise the patient and they'll have apprehension again. That's called the surprise test. Now, you can also do a drawer test by just simply uh, taking the arm and do it just like you do with the knee. And you want to look for multidirectional instability, systemic laxity in the sulcus sign for multidirectional instability. You have a patient with a large sulcus sign like that, you have to be careful about doing your conventional surgery because it may fail. You may need to do a more aggressive capsular reduction technique. With posterior instability, look first for loss of external rotation. Because if a patient has a locked posterior shoulder dislocation, like this gentleman on the left side, he will be unable to externally rotate because his shoulder is posteriorly displaced. Also, you need to look for a jerk test, not necessarily named from the examiner that's doing it, but based upon the fact that the shoulder jerks back into position as you take it across the body. It jerks back in, and usually more often as you try to bring it back across the body, it will jerk out posteriorly. So that's called the jerk test. Posterior drawer test, again, just simply grabbing and stabilizing the scapula and, and displacing the shoulder posteriorly. Also, try to examine for the superior labrum and the biceps. We have several tests for this. None of them are entirely specific, but it's a combination of these tests that is helpful. First of all, just get a feel for bicipital groove tenderness. If they have tenderness there, maybe they have biceps or slap pathology. One of the most important tests we've learned recently is the O'Brien's test. The O'Brien's test is where you have your arms uh, completely pronated in the front of you and you resist the, the motion downward. That should cause pain. As you supinate those same arms and resist, you should have less pain. O'Brien's test. That's for slap tears. And then a crank test has also been described where you put your fingers in the bicipital groove and simply try to crank that arm and see if you can get it to pop and be tender in the bicipital groove. So again, no test is completely specific and sensitive for slap tears, but it's a combination of these, and then assessment with imaging. Well, how about muscle ruptures? Well, subscaps, as we already talked about, has a positive liftoff sign shown here. They also may have uh, the belly press test or abduction compression test. If they can't get their arm back there, they can't maintain that when they're pushing their body, also called the Napoleon sign. And then a subtle thing, but important is, somebody who has a subscap tear may have more external rotation on that side than the other side because they don't have the restraint of the subscap. If you have a pectoralis injury, you may have axillary webbing, as shown in this gentleman right here. And, of course, we're all familiar with the Popeye sign, consistent with the biceps rupture. How about for impingement and cuff disease? We look for impingement sign, passively forward flexing the arm. Impingement test, do that again after you've given a subacromial lidocaine injection. Hawkins sign and test, similar. You simply put it in the forefront and internally rotate, as shown down here. Hawkins sign, look for weakness and atrophy, we've already talked about. And this gentleman right here is demonstrating what happens with a massive irreparable cuff tear. He is called the sign du clairon, or home blower, horn blower sign. He's unable to get his right arm up in this position because it's so profoundly uh, weak and torn. Moving on to radiographs. It's important to always get an axillary lateral radiograph, and our ER colleagues never seem to understand that. And therefore, one of the first things you do when you get somebody from the emergency room in your clinic is to get an axillary lateral because they always fail to do it. Two APs, one in external and one in internal rotation, is not count. The other thing you need to look at on the AP is look for proximal migration of the humerus. If you see a lot of older patients, you'll be seeing a lot of rotator cuff disease. And once they have significant proximal migration of the humerus, you should not try to repair their cuff because it's irreparable more often than not. The other thing is looking on the axillary lateral radiograph, making sure that your ER colleagues did not miss a posterior shoulder dislocation. Look for several, there's other several special views as well, including the Hill-Sachs view, 
which allows you to, or Hill-Sachs lesions, which you can see in a, one of two x-rays, either a striker notch view or an AP in internal rotation. And those two films will allow you to look for a Hill-Sachs defect. For some reason on the boards and the OITs, they, they prefer the AP in internal rotation. But you get some view looking for a Hill-Sachs defect. You should also get a view looking for a bony Bankart lesion in instability, and the classic for that is the West Point view, which is modified axillary lateral with the patient prone. You can also do what's called a Garth view, but most people do the West Point view. When you look for impingement, you look for an outlet view, as described by Bigliani, and it shows either flat, curved, or in this case, hooked acromions. Hooked acromions more associated with rotator cuff pathology. Rockwood's described a caudal tilt view, which allows you to look at the, the uh, acromion with a 30-degree caudal tilt, and it allows you to characterize the morphology as well. CT scans, very helpful for fractured visualization, and perhaps most importantly, evaluating the glenoid for glenoid fractures, or when you're considering a total shoulder arthroplasty, you want to look at the glenoid version, best seen on CT scan. MRI, of course, very helpful for rotator cuff disease, also helpful for labrum pathology, superior and anterior and posterior. Shoulder arthroscopy has come a long ways from just 10 years ago. Allows us to not only make diagnosis, but to treat shoulder problems that we weren't able to just a, a decade previously. There's two different ways to position the patient. Lateral to cubitus, beach chair, both are equally efficacious. The only potential question here is lateral decubitus sometimes can be associated with neuropraxias from the traction that's used. The portals, of course, very well described. The primary viewing portal, the, the posterior portal, is two centimeters distal and two centimeters medial to the posterior lateral edge of the acromion. The anterior superior portal used very commonly for viewing and also for subacromial arthroscopy and debridement. The anterior inferior portal, more distal than that portal, used very commonly for anterior shoulder instability for placing uh, anchors and tying knots. We also have the lateral portal, very commonly used for subacromial decompressions. Other portals include the navisor portal, which can be used for slap tears done through the fibers of the cuff. Another portal not shown here is the port of Wilmington, which is just off the just anterior to the posterior lateral edge of the chromium port of Wilmington, helpful for assessing posterior slap areas. Recognize that arthroscopically you're not seeing the entire subscap, you're only seeing about a quarter of it. And that was a test question in and of itself. There's two kinds of shoulder instability. Matson has described these for us. Tubs, traumatic, unidirectional, has a bank art, and often needs surgery. That's the kind you want to see in your clinic. Then the other kind of shoulder instability is ambry, atraumatic, multidirectional, often bilateral. They'll have, a, they'll have systemic, hyper in, the systemic uh, laxity. Those respond to rehabilitation, rehab, rehab, rehab. There should be like six R's in ambry because you need six months of rehab before you consider doing a capsular volume reducing procedure, classically an inferior capsular shift. Nowadays, people are doing that more and more with arthroscopic plication. But the key is to reduce the volume. Well, let's talk about tubs first. Acute traumatic dislocation is, the recurrence is directly correlates with the patient's age. The younger, the more likely they have a recurrence. So the biggest complication rate with shoulder instability is recurrence, particularly in young patients. And those recurrence rates in teenagers and, and young adults approaches 80 to 90 percent recurrence. So that's a very high uh, recurrence rate. And that's why more and more people are considering doing initial first-time dislocators, repair of the essential lesion, the bank heart repairs in that age group, particularly in places like West Point where they have very active uh, patients. Probably through your boards, however, it's the, the appropriate answer is conservative management in that setting. It's very unlikely for them to give you a West Point cadet on your boards. As far as examination, we've already talked about the apprehension relocation tests. The initial treatment recently, and this is getting now two plus years out, so if they give you an option of splitting the patient in external rotation, that's probably an appropriate answer. They may not give you that option, but if they do, it's appropriate. And that's from the Japanese studies that show that the, the labrum gets more closely opposed to the edge of the glenoid in a more anatomic fashion with 
abducts with external rotation uh, uh, splint. And so now in a lot of emergency rooms across the country, we're starting to put patients in external rotation splints with first-time dislocators. It may allow it to heal better. And in fact, the Japanese study that showed a clinical correlate of that showed that indeed the redislocation rate went markedly down with an external rotation splint. Whether that occurs in the American populations yet to be seen, but at least in Japan, that's been shown. Associated lesions with uh, anterior dislocations included the classic bank heart tear, the essential lesion, hill sacs defects, which is of little consequence unless they're very large, and if they so-called engage the humerus. If they engage the humerus, when you're looking at it arthroscopically, then you need to do something about it. Also, anterior dislocations are associated with greater tuberosity fractures. So that's a question that's asked often as well. Anterior dislocation, greater tuberosity fractures. Posterior dislocation, lesser tuberosity fractures. So if you just remember that association, that'll help you out. Now, in older patients, over 40 like myself, you're often going to have a rotator cuff tear when you have a shoulder dislocation. So when patients come in and they have a history of a shoulder dislocation in this older patient group, the first thing I consider is not fixing his essential lesion, his bank heart tear, but I'm worried if he has a cuff tear. Because if I don't recognize that and I don't fix it, then it's going to go on to a big problem. And it's not recurrent instability. It can go on to an irreparable cuff tear. The other thing common in older patients, at least if you do EMGs in these patients, you'll see a lot of them have transient nerve injuries. So the nerve injuries can occur in up to 50% of these patients. They're mostly transient, but they occur. And they occur on tests as well. So recognize that nerve injuries are common. So when we're asked about the sequela of, of shoulder instability and the complications, young patients, recurrence, older patients, nerve injuries, and cuff tears. Well, the classic way to treat anterior instability is an open bank art repair. Nowadays, we can also do that arthroscopically. And so it's approaching the fact that we can do this arthroscopically as well as we used to, to be able to do it open. And that's probably a reasonable answer if given the choice in the boards. They're probably not going to force you down between choosing between open and arthroscopic because they're both efficacious. But nowadays, the arthroscopic is equally efficacious. The other thing we're starting to realize is that a lot of times you may have to do some type of shoulder capsular procedure in addition to your bank heart repair particularly in the person who's had recurrent dislocations. Because with recurrent dislocation, Bigliani again, has showed us that this results in capsular stretching. Every time you dislocate, you stretch your capsule some more. So that in addition to the bank heart for these recurrent cases, you may have to do a capsular plication or classically a capsular shift. Arthroscopic procedures, less pain, preserves motion, and uh, we can do this in most cases. However, if you have a large glenoid defect, the so-called inverted pair, where you're missing a good portion of the bone in the inferior glenoid, then you need to supplement that, and that has to be done with an open procedure and a bone graft. Also, if you have an engaging hill sacs lesion, that defect in the humeral head engages as you abduct the external rotate the shoulder, then you need to fill that defect or restrict external rotation so they can't engage. Historically, there's been a variety of procedures for anterior instability. The one that works the best is the anatomic procedure. Anytime on your boards or in practice, if you're thinking about what procedure to do, go with the anatomic procedure because it works the best. In the shoulder, that happens to be a bank art repair and a capsular shift. In the ankle, that happens to be a brostrum operation. So repair, repair the normal anatomy whenever possible. These historic procedures that did not repair the normal anatomy, but instead tried to tie up the subscap, like the putty plat and the mag stack, those resulted in problems. They have arthritis down the line because they wore out the posterior glenoid because they restricted their external rotation so bad and they got arthritis. So capsulography arthropathy is a result of restricting the motion in these putty plat and mag stack procedures. The Bristow procedure, also known as the ladder jet procedure, takes the coracoid, detaches it, with an osteotomy and moves it down to the base of the glenoid. The problem with that, as you can imagine, non-union hardware problems, and uh, those were historically a problem. However, you can use that corticoid instead of iliac crest if you choose to, to put, fill that defect in the so-called inverted pair. And so there's a couple different ways to do that. So it still has a role with inverted pair glenoids. Again, complications, the most common thing is recurrence. 
The common thing also in the past has been unrepaired labral tears for these procedures such as mag stacks, et cetera, where they never looked in the joint. Complications post-op from open shoulder surgery, very common subscapularis injuries. So it, it is very rare that there's, not, there's an exam that doesn't test this concept at least once and often more than once, and that is patient had X procedure, either an anterior capsular shift or had a uh, hemiarthroplasty, and they didn't repair the subscap very well or the subscap repair didn't work, what have you, and therefore they have a subscap that's deficient. So they'll have a positive liftoff sign, they'll have excessive external rotation, and they'll have all those things we talked about with the subscap injury because they love to ask those questions. The other thing you can do is you sometimes can get an axillary nerve injury, and we all know how nervous you get as you go further and further down inferiorly when you're trying to get exposure for a total shoulder uh, or a capsular shift. And the way you avoid that is to abduct and externally rotate the arm as you're going down there and to feel, palpate the axillary nerve and to try to prevent the injury to that. The other complication with shoulder procedures, open shoulder procedures for shoulder instability, is to make the subscap and capsule too tight. If that happens, people lose external rotation. And the treatment, the classic treatment, is a Z lengthening of the subscap. Other complications, we've already discussed uh, nerve injuries on EMGs, particularly in older patients. Uh, late arthritis, which involves posterior glenoid wear. And the famous migrating hardware. Let's talk about posterior instability now. Less common than anterior instability, but more commonly missed. This can either be acute or chronic, voluntary or involuntary, and often has a multidirectional component, such as this patient with hypermobility of their joints. When you have patients with hypermobility of the joints in the AMBRI category, more often than not, you need to address the capsule and do an aggressive volume-reducing procedure. Posterior instability is classically associated with seizures or shock, and so if you have an exam question and the guy had a seizure, you're thinking right away, maybe they have a posterior instability. And that's probably a good bet. They'll show up with decreased external rotation because they didn't get an axillary lateral radiograph and they failed to make the diagnosis in the emergency room, and you're the hero. Treatment initially acute is a closed reduction, and chronically you can do an open reduction. Chronically, you can do an open reduction up to three months after you, the patient had that instability episode. So sometimes you can still save the day even three months afterwards. And when you do that, you need to address the reverse hill sacs defect because there's an impression, a hatchet defect in the humerus from that being out so long. So you simply, from a practical standpoint, approach this, go down through the subscap and capsule, peel it back, and put your Facuda retractor in there and pop the humerus back in. When you do that, you're staring at a giant reverse hill sacs defect. Be prepared to fill that, either with a piece of the lesser tuberosity or an allograft, as shown here. If it's too big, more than 50% or 40%, then you have to do a hemiarthroplasty, fill it with metal. Let's talk about the more subtle degrees of posterior instability. This includes subluxation, which occurs very commonly in football linemen as they block. The shoulder gets pushed posteriorly and causes repetitive insults, stretching out of the posterior capsule. This also occurs in baseball pitchers in the follow-through as the shoulder gets posteriorly subluxed. And so in that case, we have to do, first of all, rehabilitation, if at all possible, emphasizing the infraspinatus or the external rotator. And so the test question first, the answer is strengthening the infraspinatus, strengthening the external rotator. That may be all you need to know. But if you don't, if you fail that after six months of trial of therapy, then you can do a posterior capsular shift. Again, either open or arthroscopically, reducing the posterior volume of the capsule, which is harder to do because that capsule is thin. How about thermal shrinkage? Well, if there's one message I've given you on the podium, it's that we don't do thermal shrinkage. And why don't we? Because there's problems with it. Sure, it looks neat to shrink that tissue, but in reality, it doesn't seem to work very well. And there's lots of problems. The biggest problem is probably recurrence rate. In those patients with systemic laxity with loose capsules, the failure rate with this th thermal shrinkage is up to 50%. You're not going to do very well in your practice if you have you're trying to push operations that have failure rates of 50%. The other problem, and some devastating injuries have occurred with this, capsular necrosis, where the capsule completely disappears after you shrink it, articular cartilage 
death, chondrocyte death involving the entire joint as the case we saw from our musculoskeletal radiologist this week. Axillary nerve injury from frying the inferior part of the capsule. So, if you're the Oratech man, perhaps you ought to get branch out into other uh, opportunities. Let's go to rotator cuff disease. This occurs in the older population, patients over 40 classically. They may have night pain, and it's important to get that. If you hear night pain on the exam, you think rotator cuff disease or tumors. They may have a Popeye muscle because their proximal biceps ruptured. They have the classic impingement signs, and also they have weakness with abduction and external rotation. The x-rays we talked about. And the MRI is important not only to make the diagnosis, but also to look at the quality of the muscle you're considering repairing. If the muscle has significant fatty atrophy, you're unlikely to be successful in repairing that. More often than not, that's associated with significant retraction in that muscle. If it retracts, gets atrophy and fibrotic, it's very difficult to repair, and it probably isn't going to work. And of course, the ultimate stage of rotator cuff disease is rotator cuff arthropathy, where you have proximal migration of the humerus and articulates with the acromion. That certainly is not going to work with a rotator cuff repair. Osochromonal associated with rotator cuff disease because it can hinge and pinch on the uh, cuff. And so the incidence is about 3%. And the reason it's important to know this is because it modifies what you do for your decompression. So if somebody has a large os, then maybe your acromioplasty is not going to work. And sometimes you have to consider doing a fusion operation to fuse that os before or instead of an acromioplasty. What about outlet impingement? That's the main concept here of impingement. And so this is a classic uh, near description. Some people have uh, argument with this, but there's clearly a traction osteophyte seen with this. You can see sometimes if you're looking and you can see a cuff tear that's directly related to the impinging of that acromion. And in that setting, it's certainly appropriate to do subacromial injections and then acromioplasties. If you, however, you're doing an arthroscopy and you get in the subacromial space and it looks beautiful, then perhaps this wasn't the problem and you need to go back in the glenohumeral joint and look more closely. There's also an impingement called subcoracoid impingement described by Christian Gerber. This has to do with the coracoid impinging on the subscap. Some people think this is implicated in subscap tears. And uh, you can get a CT scan and look at the normal distances shown here uh, for the distance between the humerus and the coracoid. If you have a very lateral displaced coracoid and may or may not have a subscap tear, then some authors would recommend you do a coracoid plasty. Now, believe it or not, you can do that arthroscopically by just simply debriding that area, and then you can do a shaver and a burr and uh, debride that. But the classic technique is open. Moving on with rotator cuff disease, you should uh, certainly consider doing a rotator cuff repair if you have a cuff tear that you've identified. And the reason for that is because the natural history of rotator cuff tears is they'll often progress and become more and more difficult and then ultimately impossible to repair. When you do a rotator cuff repair, whether you do it arthroscopically or open, the early therapy is passive, limited passive rotation, motion. Not active, passive, limited passive motion. That's often asked on exams. And from a practical standpoint, the way you do that is you give the patient a pulley and a stick kit so that they can passively move their arm uh, in, in that fashion. Now, if you have advanced rotator cuff disease at the far end of the spectrum, rotator cuff arthropathy, you have irreparable tear, and so the classic answer for that is to do a hemiarthroplasty. And the hemiarthroplasty will certainly relieve their pain, but it will not improve their function. And that's why nowadays there are some new concepts out that will not be on your boards, but just so you're aware of it, is the so-called delta or reverse prosthesis. And so that may be an option in the future. We'll see. Our European colleagues have more experience than we do. But for your boards, the answer for cuff arthropathy is hemiarthroplasty. Now, this uh, swine mucosa that uh, you patch in there really hadn't panned out, hadn't shown to increase strength, and probably not the correct thing to do. Arthroscopic cuff repair, we all know it has a steep learning curve. The techniques and equipment continues to improve, and it's given us a whole new vocabulary and has thrust many of us to the bottom of the learning curve once again in arthroscopy. And so as we climb back up, we understand the concept of margin convergence 
That is, if you have a U-shaped tear, to try to oppose the side to side before you put it back down to the tuberosity. Interval slides in order to get some release so you can mobilize the cuff. Suture management, if you've ever been involved in cases with 15 sutures coming out of portals and you have no idea what, what they are, we understand the concept of using different colored sutures and managing the sutures. Knot or loop security, in other words, making sure your knots get tied down with a slip knot followed by half hitches. And so it's been a whole new learning curve for all of us. Well, what are some of the complications of rotator cuff treatment, either arthroscopically or open? Well, one of the biggest problems is recurrence. Some people argue there's even a higher recurrence with arthroscopic techniques. But we also know that open techniques have had problems with recurrence as well. And that's because the muscle you're fixing just isn't that good sometimes. Also, if you're doing open approaches, you could have deltoid detachment, and those people would have a defect in their anterior deltoid. Sometimes they ask on boards is the lateral concept of a lateral acromionectomy. Always the wrong answer, always a problem, always a complication. You can have acromioclavicular pain, residual pain, even after doing a so-called coplaning operation, where you try to flatten that uh, part of the clavicle. And therefore, most surgeons recommend you do, if, you, if you're going to address the clavicle, go ahead and do a distal clavicle resection, but preserve the, the fibers on top of that AC joint so you don't have the horizontal instability. You can have nerve injury, and if you, in, if you make this incision on the uh, mini open and you make it a maxi open and uh, get too close to the axillary nerve, then you can have problems with that. You can have also suprascapular uh, nerve injury. If you try too aggressively to mobilize the supraspinatus, then you can get a suprascapular nerve injury as well. Related to rotator cuff disease is calcific tendonitis. It's very often associated with impingement syndrome, and you'll see calcification in the supraspinatus. Now, the treatment for this is if you catch it early, you can supposedly aspirate it, but it's very difficult. More often than not, if you see it, you can arthroscopically decompress it and shell that calcium deposit out. Sometimes it looks like toothpaste, and you can just debride it with a shaver. Let's move on then to neurovascular disorders. I know a lot of these you've already touched on in other lectures, including the anatomy lecture. But let's just uh, one more time go through it. The key issue with the suprascapular nerve, which is one of the favorite nerves for board examiners and test writers, is because it can get impinged at different places. If it gets impinged up here underneath the transverse scapular ligament, then it can affect both the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus innervation because it haven't given those branches off yet. If, on the other hand, it gets impinged the spinoglenoid notch down here, it's already given off the nerve to the supraspinatus and will selectively affect only the infraspinatus. This is important because it allows you to address the treatment. And the treatment then is to decompress that cyst. The cyst is almost always associated with a labral tear, just like the meniscal cyst is associated with meniscus tear. And therefore, the treatment has evolved to decompress the cyst by decompressing the labral tear and uh, repairing that labral tear. This can also happen as super, the, uh, the suprascapular nerve can be uh, impinged and affect the infraspinatus in volleyball players. So you may see a question where a volleyball player has that problem, and then you get electrodiagnostic studies and it gives you the diagnosis. So if you see a volleyball player, they may have jumper's knee or they may have a selective uh, impingement of the in, uh, nerve to the infraspinatus. Moving on then, the thoracic outlet syndrome. It's an unusual problem that can be related to a cervical rib or a scalene muscle hypertrophy. Uh, it can occur also sometimes with a clavicle nonunion or malunion. It occurs more commonly in females. And there are four different tests for these, all provocative. Adson's, right, brace, military brace test, overhand exertion test. All of those tests either diminish the pulses or, or develop those symptoms when they, when they do those. And the treatment then is to remove that cervical rib or the offending structure. Typically, this is done by a thoracic surgeon. How about quadrilateral space syndrome? Well, that's another unusual problem shown also by musculoskeletal radiologists, involves compression of the axillary nerve. The way you make that diagnosis is remember what goes with the axillary nerve, that is the posterior humeral circumflex artery. And if you do an arteriogram, you may see that artery constricted in the quadru quadrangular or quadrilateral space. If that's the case, then you simply release it. 
Other neurovascular disorders commonly asked is you may have a neuropathic joint. In other words, the joint's just destroyed and you have no idea why. Well, the number one cause for that is syringomyelia. The number two cause is Hansen's disease or leprosy. Not necessarily in our country, I hope, but certainly in uh, other countries that can occur. The other thing that can happen is you can get thrombosis of the axillary or subclavian artery. And if you have a pitcher that's getting ischemic pain as he's throwing, then you ought to consider that diagnosis. Again, definitive diagnosis with an arteriogram. How about muscle injuries? Well, the most commonly asked is pectoralis major ruptures. Do you know that there has never been a case reported in a female of a pectoralis major rupture? So as you go out there, if you notice that, then uh, you may get your case report. And it will change the answer on every test given to this date because they try to trick you on this and tell you, ask if it's a woman that has a pectoralis major rupture. It's never been reported. It does occur in male weightlifters. They have weak adduction and internal rotation, and they may have axillary webbing. Here's an example of a complete pec rupture ripped off of there. Here is the, 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 uh, the rib cage, and here is the muscle humerus over here. Well, how about a subscap rupture? We've already talked about that. They love asking about subscap ruptures, and the key issue is they'll have that liftoff sign, and they may have a biceps that, dis that displaces. So if you get an MRI and you see a medial displacement of the biceps, suspect that the subscap is torn. So when you repair the subscap, you need to stabilize the biceps or tenodesic. Slap tears. Here's another thing that's probably overdiagnosed by a lot of us, and because it's sometimes difficult to figure out whether that's an anatomic variant or a true slap tear. So as you're doing your shoulder arthroscopy, look carefully at that biceps anchor. Make sure it's just not inserted more medially. Make sure it looks like the cartilage has been injured or that the tissue is hypermobile at that anchor because I think there's a lot of slap tears being reported out in that country that, that really didn't need to be repaired. The classic description of these by Snyder, types 1 through 4. One, just some fraying where you can uh, bill for a limited debridement in just about every patient. Type 2 involves the classic detachment of the superior labrum uh, from the superior glenoid. And you can see that's a classic type 2 lesion right here. Now, the type 2 has been subcategorized into just the front, the front and the back, or just the back. Regardless, it's still a type 2. Type 3 has a normal intact anchor and a displaced uh, uh, labrum. Uh, type 4, a labrum and a biceps anchor that splits up into the biceps. Uh, that's a very unusual injury. And then the types 5, 6, 7, etc are all associated with instability, and sometimes you can actually have 180 or 360 degree tears. The important thing to realize about all these classification schemes is if the anchor is unstable, you need to stabilize it. If the labrum is just loose and the anchor is okay, then just to breed the labrum. And so regardless of the classification scheme, which they probably won't ask you about, they may ask you about the importance of stabilizing the anchor or the importance of debreeding loose flaps of tissue, which is something we do arthroscopically all the time. The one thing, the maneuver you can do in a baseball pitcher if you suspect a posterior slap tear is to abduct and external rotate the arm while you're doing the scope. And if the labrum and uh, posterior labrum peels back, revealing a posterior slap tear, then you should fix it. And many authors feel like internal impingement or in these pitchers can sometimes be associated with a posterior slap tear. And if you're treating a pitcher and you see this, this is a home run because it's a lot easier to take care of this than it is some of the other internal impingements, which we haven't quite figured out. Here's the other problem with, in, with the internal uh, impingement or p baseball pitchers with problems is this GERD concept, which has been popularized by Morgan and Burkhart. And what you have is that most people will have 180 degrees of motion of their arm. The baseball pitchers will have more external rotation and therefore at the expense of internal rotation. And so they have internal rotation deficits. And the way you address these is with a thing called a sleeper stretcher, where you simply encourage them to lay on that affected side and to stress and internally rotate and push their arm to improve their internal rotation deficit. And so you need six months of stretching before you consider doing surgery. This individual here, baseball pitcher, has marked internal rotation defect in his throwing arm and normal on the other side. At the expense of that, he can get his arm all the way back, way back in a cocking position, which makes him a better thrower. 
So again, treatment, uh, strengthening, capsular stretching, and occasionally now then when you get into the ultimate thing, what do you do for surgery? Well, Morgan and Burkhart say you do a posterior capsular relief. Uh, Andrew says you do an anterior stabilization with the shrinkage. Well, we'll see. Uh, but that's the classic argument. Again, internal impingement, entrapment of the posterior superior cuff and labrum during late cocking, early acceleration. You can sometimes have partial articular sided cuff tears, uh, and those are easily debrided. The problem is, what do you do with the rest? And that is the dilemma. And so, uh, in this country right now, there's two camps the posterior stretching or release camp and the anterior stabilizing camp. And so, because their controversy exists, they certainly won't give you both those answers. The other thing you can get with this is a Bennett's lesion. And probably the only testable thing is to recognize what it is. And so if you get a shoulder radiograph and it has this little excrescence down here, that can be associated with internal impingement in baseball players, and it's called a Bennett lesion. Described way back in 1941. Perhaps Dr. Bennett had a better feel for this than we do, even today. So let's look at some of these arthroscopic signs. You start off with the arthroscopy looking for slap tears. You do a standard arthroscopy and there is increased laxity. You can drive through the shoulder. That's because of the circle concept. If you have a labral tear, then the circle concept allows you to have more instability because the labrum should be tight all the way around. If it's not, then you have increased laxity. So you see a drive through sign. Also associated with anterior instability. You may see a posterior slap tear shown here which is accentuated by abducting and external rotating the arm, causing the peel-back phenomenon. And then here we have that classic partial cuff tear described with internal impingement. Now that that's clear as mud, let's move on to other disease processes. AC separations are a result of a direct trauma and have classically been described in types 1 through 6. Type 6 has only been seen by one person one time, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. The real issue here is differentiating between types 3, 4, and 5. The way you do that is first with an axillary lateral radiograph, our emergency room doctor's favorite friend that he doesn't ever visit, and that is to look for a type 4 AC separation. You'll see on the axillary lateral the clavicle displacing backwards towards the trapezius or into the trapezius. That makes the diagnosis of a type 4 AC separation. So you need an axillary lateral for that one. Well, how do you differentiate between 3 and 5? And this is often misunderstood even by orthopedic surgeons. The difference is, if you go back to the original article, how much displacement compared to the other side. So you simply get a bilateral AC joint views, both shoulders, no weights. You don't need all that stuff. That's, that's not necessary. Just plain old AC views and measure the distance from the top of the coracoid to the bottom of the clavicle, just a straight line distance on both shoulders. If it's displaced superiorly in less than 100% of the other side, it's a type 3 at most. If it's displaced more than 100% of the other side, that then makes the diagnosis of a type 5 AC separation. Why is that important? Well, because most authors recommend surgical intervention for types 4, 5, and 6. Again, 6 you're never going to see, but 4 and 5. So, you need the axillary lateral to diagnose the 4, you need the bilateral AC views to diagnose type 5, and then you operate on types 4s and 5s. 5s will often buttonhole through the deltal trapezial fascia as well. Moving on, distal clavicle osteolysis. Repetitive microfracture of the end of the collarbone causes osteopenia, pain in weightlifters. You either get the weightlifters to quit lifting weights or modify their, their, their technique by moving their arms further apart, which rarely helps. Or, more often than not, they're so dedicated and so anxious to return to weightlifting that you have to take off the end of their clavicle. And you can do that either open or arthroscopically, both with good results. How about arthritis of the AC joint? This is very commonly associated with impingement syndrome. And so when you're doing an operation for rotator cuff problems or impingement operations, you need to have assessed this before going to the OR to know whether to make it a complete blue plate special. That is a chromioplastic distal clavicle resection and rotator cuff repair, as well as a limited debris mark. Um, so by the time you do all four of those, you're at 12.5% reimbursement for your last case. So you better know which CPT code to use first, which we'll discuss next. At any rate, um, the bottom line is, is that uh, if the patient has 
pain in the AC joint, pain with cross-chest adduction, then that may be the AC that's the problem, and you confirm that with radiographs and MRIs, and if necessary then, make the distal clavicle resection a part of your blue plate special. On the other hand, on the other side of the clavicle, it's not quite so easy, sternoclavicular injuries. Um, the problem with this joint is there's big, bad vessels behind it. So don't mess with the sternoclavicular joint. I know it's popular in some centers to do some cool surgery there. It's not the right answer on the board. Don't operate on that joint. Don't put any hardware in that joint because it will be the wrong answer. And so the way you can look at this, get a CT scan classically, uh, anterior instability. The question always is somebody comes in three or four weeks after they had an anterior SC joint, what do you do? Look the other way. Go to the next room. Don't do anything with that patient. Because you just put them in a sling, treat them symptomatically, they'll do fine. Uh, posterior instability, you reduce those uh, if you can. This is where you, Rockwood's text classically says you go to the OR, you put a uh, towel underneath their sternum, you have a sterile towel clip that you put on there, and you get a vascular surgeon in the room, and you, play, you pray that he doesn't have to scrub in. Moving on. Recognize that around the clavicle, sternoclavicular, comioclavicular, etc., that the tube of periosteum that surrounds the clavicle, is, which is the last bone to fuse, uh, persists well into the patient's mid-20s. So if you have a 20-year-old person you're treating, recognize that can be a physeal injury, and more often they're not going to be treated non-operatively. The one pearl for the exam, avoid pins and hardware around the clavicle, around the sternoclavicular joint, because of all the classic articles of those migrating into lungs and aortas and all kind of bad stuff. Moving on. Adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder. Patients have decreased range of motion, particularly external rotation, and there's no other cause. No injuries, no fractures, etc. Often follows lung surgery or breast surgery or hospitalization. Very commonly associated with an autoimmune diseases such as diabetes or thyroid disease. On imaging, on arteriograms, or uh, more commonly uh, in uh, MRI or arthrograms, we'll see a loss of the axillary recess. Treatment for adhesive capsulitis is not, on the board exam, manipulation under anesthesia. So if you see adhesive capsulitis, the patient probably hasn't had any rehab, don't do a manipulation unless you want to answer wrong. So you need to rehab those people with moist heat, stretching, conservative program for months and months and months and months and months before you ever consider doing a lysis of adhesions or manipulation or anesthesia. So more often than not, when you see this in the exam, they haven't had an adequate trial of non-operative management, and that is the right answer regardless of what you do in the practice. This is the right answer for the boards is to, is to rehab them longer. Scapular winging. There's two kinds of winging. The reason, the way these wingings are named is based upon the inferior border of the scapula. If the inferior border of the scapula goes medial, that's medial winging. And that's the classic long thoracic nerve injury here. Medial winging, long thoracic nerve, backpacker may have been backpacking out in the, in the bayous and uh, develops this winging of the scapula because of compression of the long thoracic nerve. Also can occur in volleyball players again. Treatment, again, you've got to wait six months. It's a long nerve, remember. You've got to wait six months for that nerve to come back. So don't be operating in that six-month window. Give it a chance to come back. And you do that by bracing or just observation and wait for six months and see if it comes back. If it comes back, great. If it doesn't come back, then you have to do something for that surgery potentially, and that would include a pectoralis transfer. I don't know how technically you've done that. I've never done it. doesn't matter. That's the answer if you wait six months. Lateral winging, the inferior border of the scapula goes lateral. That's because the trapezius is injured. That's because some unwitting general surgery did a little a dissection to the posterior neck looking for a lymph node and dinged the, the cranial nerve 11, the accessory nerve, spinal accessory nerve. And when that happens, you get lateral winging because the border goes lateral. What do you do about that? Well, you have your general surgery guy go back and figure out whether they dinged the nerve, and release the nerve, you can strengthen the trap. You can wait for it to recover. If it doesn't, there's two options. Either fuse the scapula to the thorax or do an Eden-Lang transfer, which basically takes all the muscles on the medial border of the scapula and transfers them laterally. Again, not an operation I've ever done or look forward to doing. 
scapula thoracic crepitus. This involves popping of the scapula, and it often involves inflamed bursa. If you see an osseous lesion on a CT scan, great, home run. That's going to work wonderful. Simply whack off that osseous lesion, and you're all set. Other treatments are very controversial. Some people recommending resecting the superior medial border of the scapula. Again, and not an operation I'm looking forward to performing. And arthroscopy, which I've done a few of, and you simply continue shaving the bursa until you see either bubbles or red out. <laughs> Neither one of them is very attractive. So certainly not an answer for the boards. And uh, probably the answer is if they give you an ossify to excise it. Otherwise, uh, try to treat it with therapy. Little leaguer's shoulder, what is that? Well, it's nothing more than a type 1 physial injury to the proximal humerus. You have widened physis. And that's why they have rules about how much baseball players can pitch when they're in Little League. Unfortunately, the Little League coaches don't really understand those rules, and they push it. And they push it in practice, and they push it in batting practice, and they push it uh, in, in uh prep and warm up and they don't understand this concept and therefore you, the guy will come in your office, this kid's dying, then you simply tell him to rest, pull him off the baseball team, he's not going to make the pros based on missing one little league season uh, and allow this to heal up. And then counsel the coach to try to calm down a bit. Moving on to fractures. We all know the classic near classification about head, shaft, greater and lesser tuberosity. Those are the four parts. I think it's still a great classification scheme. Uh, and so the treatment then is to try to get those four parts back together. Well, you can do that with a closed reduction, with a percutaneous fixation sometimes. Sometimes you have to do it open. And ultimately, sometimes you can't fix it, and you have to do a hemiarthroplasty. So, bottom line, no matter how you do it, fix it if you can. And you can use a combination of wires shown here, screws shown here, nails, etc., whatever works for you. Sometimes, though, you can't fix it. And that's when you do have to do a hemiarthroplasty. How about clavicle fractures? Well, the biggest thing here is that most people writing the boards are still in a very conservative camp and still recommend not operating on most clavicle fractures. Fine. That's what you need to answer. Just recognize that. The only time you should op operate on clavicle fractures then, for the board purposes, open fractures, subclavian artery injuries, floating shoulder, uh, very distal fractures with displacement, or symptomatic non-unions. Okay? From a practical standpoint, though, we're stretching that envelope a little bit, but it's not going to occur on your boards. Here we see medial clavicle fracture, impending vascular injury, appropriate to fix that. Here we see non-union, significant shortening, uh, maybe even in paratroopers, you can fix that. Uh, and now here's a newer indication that probably won't show up on your board, but if you have three or four centimeters of overlap and, dis and displacement, then maybe you can do this with percutaneous techniques as shown here. Lateral displaced clavicle fractures, more than 10 or 15 millimeter type 2 fractures. This basically represents a type 5 AC separation, if you think about it. And therefore, that's probably best treated operatively as well. Let's move on. Avascular necrosis occurs very commonly in the hip and also occurs in the shoulder, very similar to the hip. It occurs with steroids, alcohol, deep sea divers, post-traumatic. And so it's simply a prognosis related to the stage of the disease. If you get to the stage shown here, then you need a shoulder replacement. Early stages, you may be able to do core decompressions. Moving on then, shoulder arthritis. Patients may have pain, crepitus, previous uh, uh, mag stack shown here, uh, and uh, they may have posterior glenoid wear and osteophytes. Treatment initially, anti-inflammatory, supportive glucosamine chondroitin sulfate, uh, arthroscopic debridement may have a role, uh, and then eventually arthroplasty. Moving us nicely then into the category of total shoulder arthroplasty, which I promised you we'd spend a little time on, which we haven't in the past years. The bottom line is for total shoulder arthroplasty, pain relief is the most predictable benefit. Now that's for a total shoulder arthroplasty. That means you do the humerus and the glenoid. If you don't do the glenoid, then you're not going to have as predictable pain relief, and the glenoids can, can continue to wear. And therefore, the total shoulder results are better than the hemiarthroplasty results, for glenohumeral arthritis because the glenoid continues to wear. Uh, with a total shoulder, you have good survival at 10 and 15 years. And so the indications are pain, like any other joint, pain that affects their lifestyle and incapacitating to them with symmetric glenoid wear, because if you don't have symmetric wear, then you have to do something to build up the glenoid to make it work. Uh, 
And if you have uh, the other indication is if you have um, the indication for, for uh, uh, if you have posterior subluxation and axillary lateral, lateral, then you may need to address the glenoid as well. So where and arthritis. What are we seeing here? Well, you're seeing proximal migration of the humerus, and that's associated with rotator cuff arthropathy. This is a contraindication to a total shoulder arthroplasty, i.e., you can't put the glenoid in there because it will rock and loosen quickly. You can put the humeral head in there, or more likely a CTA, which covers the rest of the head as well, but you can't put a glenoid in there because it will rock out. So the important board concept here is they show you this picture, do not recommend a total shoulder. You can do a hemiarthroplasty, but not a total shoulder. You also cannot do a total shoulder in patients with deltoid dysfunction, infection like any other joint, insufficient glenoid stock because you can't put the component in there, uh, brachial plexus palsy. They won't work in those, in those settings. Again, posterior glenoid wear is very common. We've already talked about that multiple times. And therefore, if you're going to do a total shoulder, you need to build up that glenoid before you do it. Uh, also, you need to make sure you check your rotator cuff. Uh, you need to check the capsule. Very common in these conditions is the anterior capsule is very tight. And so you need to do some releases and even Z lengthenings of the shoulder and subscap uh, capsule complex as part of your procedure. And you try to get better stability and better angles as you do it. Uh, as you're setting up then for a total shoulder, make sure you get a CT scan because you need to look at the glenoid and see what kind of version you're in so you can plan the appropriate uh, bone grafting and or uh, component placement. The glenoid, the couple things are testable here. Number one, the peg design is biomechanically superior to a keel design. And therefore, most shoulder surgeons have migrated to a peg design. The other thing is that uh, convex are better than uh, flat glenoids, and most designs have migrated to a convex design. Uh, the other thing is that metal back components are not favored in the shoulder. And so we simply use the polyethylene with the peg design uh, as the best components. Conforming versus non-conforming. Uh, the conforming can lead to rim stress and radiolucencies. The non-conforming can have more polyethylene wear. So it's a trade-off. The biggest complications, and here is probably the testable questions, the biggest complications of toller shoulder is loosening, particularly the glenoid loosening. You can also have complications with malposition of the components, improper soft tissue balancing, which is tough. You have to do the capsule releases and is often the Z lengthenings. If you try to put a total shoulder in rotator cuff tear, it's going to fail. If you have subscap dysfunction, it's just like in the instability. If you don't put the subscap down, down right, then you're going to have a problem with it. And then the post-op rehab, again, emphasizing passive motion early. Failure. Glenoid loosening. Once again, I'm hammering this because it's on all the exams. 2.9% rate for loosening, 28% of all revisions, and some other fun facts for you there. The other thing is, if you don't have a good external rotation, you need to do a Z capsule or lengthening as part of your procedure. What do you do about that posterior glenoid wear? Well, you can put a piece of iliac crest in there to make up for that before you do your glenoid. The other option is to take a piece of the humerus you just whacked out and put in there. If you fracture during your procedure, you need to take it out and put a longer stem in and then circlage the, uh, the fracture. Just like anything else, you go two, biometers, two diameters beyond the fracture with your new stem. If you have excessive posterior laxity, you may have to do a posterior clapsular pication as part of your procedure. Remove the osteophytes, uh, do your releases, restore your rotation. Rehab, again, passive motion, just like with the other shoulder procedures, and then progress to isometrics and rotation. Well, what about biologic resurfacing? What does that mean? Well, in younger patients, you're a little reluctant to throw a glenoid in there because you know the glenoid's going to wear over time. So one option that's been developed is to throw in a piece of soft tissue in there to try to give you a biologic resurfacing. You'll see across the country people are doing all kind of crazy stuff. Yamaguchi putting lateral menisci into the glenoids is a biologic resurfacing. 
That's not, you know, that's, that's interesting. And uh, the problem is getting that tissue is not easy, at least in my center. So it's a reasonable thing to consider is to put a soft tissue construct in the glenoid uh, in order to prolong the life of the glenoid, just so you're aware of that. Rotator cuff arthropathy, the key question once again is do not use a glenoid component for this because it will rock it out of place. Uh, and uh, you also, the other key question here is preserve the coracoacromial ligament. So if you have a massive cuff tear and you're trying to fix it, don't just whack out the coracoacromial ligament and let it fly because then your humerus will migrate and escape into the subcutaneous tissues. Patients don't like humeruses and subcutaneous tissues. And then along came the reverse prosthesis. Again, not testable, just for your information. This is coming along and can hopefully have a salvage for these patients with escape uh, and requires an intact deltoid. Uh, and uh, we'll see how this works in the long term, but expect complications in the short term. So all we need to cover for that. Now, hemiarthroplasty for fractures. A, cute, a few key points that will be on your exam and that is the height consideration. The greater tuberosity should be below the top of the humerus when you're done. The greater tuberosity, top of the greater tuberosity should be below the top of the humerus when you're done with hemiarthroplasty. And so what you do is you cement this proud. You mobilize your tuberosity fragments. You tie them to each other, to the shaft, and to the prosthesis. And often you put a piece of bone graft in there underneath those tuberosity fragments. A couple tricks you can use is to try to figure out whether the biceps and the cuff tension is restored. You should have it about, make sure it's below the head, recreate the normal contour of the medial calcar, and a trick that J.P. Warner has taught us is if you see the upper border of the pectoralis tendon, the top of the head should be 53 millimeters above that, that top border of the pectoralis tendon, which is usually intact. From a practical standpoint, the other thing that's often helpful is more often than not, the medial calcar part is still intact, and so your, your neck will often lie on that medial calcar. The other thing is, where do you put your fin? Well, you put it so that the shoulder can get about 30 degrees of retroversion. Where is that? Well, typically behind the bicep groove for the main fin. So now let's go through the shoulder questions. Again, we're going to go through the concept of just going through odd questions. Wrong answers, uh, doing too many MRIs and scopes, putty plat, mag stack, bristo, initial operative treatment of frozen shoulder, uh, that is manipulation under anesthesia. The board doesn't really like steroid injections uh, or manipulation under anesthesia. They don't like you treating clavicle fractures, so even though it's kind of cool to show pictures like that, don't do it. And don't put pins and K-wires in and around the shoulder, particularly the sternoclavicular joint. Let's go through some questions. 38-year-old woman, constant pain as a result of an MBA, marked restriction in external rotation. What does that tell you? Marked restriction in external rotation. It tells you that the emergency room, ah, emergency room, what do you know? What does that tell you? We don't have an axillary lateral. That's what that tells you. And so therefore, what do you got to get? An axillary lateral. Number three, which of the following conditions the rehab program for shoulder instability most likely result in a satisfactory response? And so again, you should do rehab in AMBRI patients. In fact, the R is in AMBRI. And therefore, atraumatic, involuntary subluxation, rehab, 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 AMBRI, R, R, R. Okay, number five. Common complication, anterior dislocation of the glenohumeral joint. Recurrent dislocation, particularly in younger patients. And that occurs mostly in younger patients. Patients older than 50, shoulder dislocation, what are we most concerned about? Well, we have cuff tear, but that's not an option. Or nerve injury, I told you it's as high as 50% on electrodiagnostic studies. Number nine, 56-year-old laborer, subcoracoid dislocation, that's an anterior dislocation. He fell off a scaffold three weeks ago, he's 56 years old, and he had a dislocation. And now he can't raise his arm. Well, imagine that. That's because he has a massive... Rotator cuff tear, and that's the first thing you're concerned about, not his labral tear. Get an MRI back, oh, he's got a bank heart tear, well, let's go fix it. No, he's got a massive rotator cuff tear. Let's worry about that. Eleven, right-handed, 35-year-old man, putty plat, uh-oh, putty plat, got arthritis. Uh, he has uh, loss of motion, and he's got some atrophy, and what's his diagnosis? Arthritis. 
Thirteen, conservative management of recurrent unidirectional posterior shoulder instability. Okay, we're going to rehab that first. What are we going to rehab? Which, which rotators are we going to rehab? Which is the only external rotator? The infraspinatus. Fifteen, immediate post-op management, large cuff tear, immediate post-op management, passive, 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 limited passive range of motion. Seventeen, seventy-two-year-old woman, irreparable, massive cuff tear, arthritis, symptomatic, what can we do for her? Her problem's pain, we can't get her motion, therefore we do a hemiarthroplasty. Nineteen. Medial dislocation, long head of the biceps. How can that happen? It's in the groove. The subscap covers it. Oh, well, we don't have a subscap. 21, 32-year-old carpenter, anterior sternoclavicular joint. Four weeks ago, four weeks ago, too late, sorry. Sling, symptomatic treatment. 23, carpenter. Medial scapular winging. Which one is that? Oh, it helps you out here big time. Electromyogram shows denervation of the long head of the thoracic nerve. Two months ago, that's a long nerve. We've got to give long nerves a long time, six months. So we're going to wait for a while. Strength the muscles, wait four more months, see what happens. 25, lateral scapular winging. Trapezius, cranial nerve 11. Little leaguer, shoulder. What do we do about that? Number four. Don't throw. 29, 17-year-old boy, closed clavicle fracture. A year ago, pain, non-union. I told you one of the options for operative intervention is symptomatic non-union, and that's the case. Therefore, we can fix that. Let's go with an even one here because it's a total shoulder question. 65-year-old woman underwent total shoulder uh, about a year ago. She can't tuck her her shirt in, that sounds like a liftoff sign to me. Examination reveals a belly press test. What's that? That's the subscap test. And therefore, we have a subscap problem. 31. Performing a cemented hemiarthroplasty shoulder, four part fracture, what do you do? All of these are important. Height of the humeral prosthesis, yes. Retroversion, yes. Behind the biceps, 30 degrees external rotated. Tuberosity below the hemorrhoid head, yes. We want it three or five millimeters below. Canal fill, sure, that's always important with the prosthesis. Repair of the rotator interval, I don't think so. Okay, good. So let's move on. Now, a lot of this stuff has already been covered in the elbow talks and the hand talks. We're just going to go quickly through this, focusing on the key sports medicine injuries uh, associated with these problems. One of those is a distal biceps avulsion. What the key here is you lose supination strength more than anything else. Some flexion, mostly supination. And the treatment then is to repair that. You repair it down to the tuberosity. Whether you use one or two incisions doesn't matter as long as you repair it. If you do do a two incision, recognize the lateral anobrachial cutaneous nerve and the brachial artery can be at risk. Uh, uh, if, you, if you neglect it, you lose supination strength and flexion strength. Tennis elbow, sports injury, tennis, uh, exacerbated by backhand strokes. ECRB is implicated, treatment, non-operative management first, then debride the ECRB. Probably not an arthroscopic answer for the boards. Other side, medial epicondylitis, golfer's elbow. This involves the pronator teres and the FCR, similar treatment. Uh, ulnar or medial collateral ligament injuries, uh, the Birmingham operation, uh, reconstruct this uh, ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, and especially occurs in pitchers. The problem with this is it's difficult to make the diagnosis. On the other side, also uh, described by uh, Mori and, uh, and uh, O'Driscoll about the so-called posterior lateral uh, or the pivot shift, lateral pivot shift to the elbow, which I think only Sean O'Driscoll knows how to perform. Uh, and the treatment here is lateral ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction. Valgus extension overload, very common in pitchers. They do get these adaptive changes, including increased valgus, uh, loss of extension, and osteophytes. Treatment then is to debride those. Elbow dislocation, most commonly posterior lateral. Splint it for less than a week. Don't put it in a splint for more than a week. 
Elbow arthritis, again, debridement the osteophytes. Little leaguer's elbow is a medial epicondyle stress fracture. The capitellar OCD also occurs, but classically this involves a medial epicondyle as a stress fracture. Treatment is activity modification. OCD of the capitellum, again, activity modification. If there's loose pieces, you may have to debride those arthroscopically. Back to the arthroscopic questions, again, a joint with nerves very close to it, what are the dangers? That's what you have to remember, and that's what you have to study, that's what you have to memorize. For the anterior medial portal, the medial antibrachial cutaneous and the median nerve are at risk. For the anterior lateral portal, the radial nerve is at risk. For the uh, posterior anterior, uh, for the uh, posterior uh, anterior medial portal, the ulnar nerve is at risk. And the posterior anterior lateral is the safest uh, of the options. <coughs> Excuse me, not posterior, but proximal. So these far proximal portals are, worse, are safer, which are two centimeters above uh, the elbow. How about wrist and hand injuries? Uh, most of these are overuse injuries, and so you simply uh, treat these with uh, a conservative management, splinting, et cetera. Uh, not, certainly not going to go into this, except to mention the fact that uh, scaphoid fractures, you need a high index of suspicion to get films at a uh, week to 10 days after the injury. Uh, DC, hope, hopefully, has been covered uh, in BC by your hand doctors. And the one thing uh, that we have in sports is this hook of the handmade fracture occurs in golfers. They miss the ball, hit the ground, hook a handmade fracture. And so what you do with that is you can take it out if you see it late. TFCC injuries, I'm sure, also covered by hand. Uh, and uh, debris or repair if possible. Uh, gymnasts can get this weird distal radial physial stress syndrome. It occurs from overdoing it, and so the treatment is to rest. Hypothenar hammer syndrome occurs in uh, carpenters and in baseball catchers. Uh, it has to do with claudication of the ulnar artery. And again, uh, symptomatic treatment is best usually. Wrist arthroscopy, another question where they're going to ask you where the portals are and what's at risk. Recognizing the risk, the portals are based upon the extensor compartments. Recognize also in the risk when you do a wrist arthroscopy, in order to diagnose a scapholunate injury, you have to see it from both the radiocarpal and the midcarpal portals to make that diagnosis. Hand injury, jersey fingers. Uh, this is the weird classification scheme that's seen what's backwards in the, and never got fixed. The Letty Parker uh, um, classification. And type 1 goes all the way to the palm, therefore has no vascular supply and needs to be fixed early. Skier's thumb. Uh, when this was gamekeeper's thumb, it wasn't part of the, the sports lecture, but now that it's skier's thumb, we've got to include it. It involves the uh, stenter lesion where the uh, collateral ligament uh, gets avulsed and gets caught behind that abductor aponeurosis. So you've got to open and fix it. Central slip injuries can cause a boutonniere, therefore you splint the PIP, not the DIP, but just the PIP in extension for six to eight weeks. Bowler plate injury, this is the so-called V sign of light, which demonstrates an incongruity to the joint. If you have incongruity, then you need to splint it uh, in an extension block splint to keep from having the incongruity and then gradually extend the, the, the joint. If you have a baseball finger, again, now that we've got the term in there, we've got to throw it in the sports lecture. This is an uh, uh, injury to the terminal extensor tendon, the DIP. It's splinted in extension or hyperextension for six to eight weeks. And the way you can tell whether a patient is compliant or not is you look at their creases. The creases will go away on the dorsal aspect of the DIP if they're being compliant. Then it's fracture base of the thumb. The key thing here is the deforming force, the abductor pollicis longus. We try to pin this, not necessarily to the other metacarpals, but to stabilize the base. You don't need to include the fracture fragment in that pinning. Let's go through some questions very quick on this. So wrong answers again, steroid injections, initial surgery for tendonitis when you haven't treated them conservatively, and just simply buddy taping jam fingers without figuring out what's going on. So, tennis player has uh, EMG activity defects in his, her tennis elbow. Uh, and the tennis elbow, of course, is ECRB. Number three, posterior lateral rotator instability is a result of injury to the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, the elbow pivot shift that uh, O'Driscoll has taught us how not to do. Five, 12 year old high school pitcher, restricted motion, fragmentation of the capitellum, 
Fragmentation, that means loose pieces. What do we do now? Well, you can scope it because there's loose pieces. If they're not, then you treat it conservatively. Seven, basketball player jammed his finger, PIP problem, what do you do? Static PIP joint for six weeks. Not buddy tape, but PIP joint uh, extension splint. Nine, jam finger, DIP, splint the DIP and slight hyperextension for six weeks. See if they're compliant by looking at their creases or lack thereof. All right, moving right along into head and spine injuries, which is also sports uh, related. Concussion, you'll see this if you're going to manage a high school football team, you'll see this on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, what it represents is an Im immediate transient impairment of neural function. You don't have to black out, uh, and you do need to worry about neck injuries that can be associated with this. So as you evaluate these patients, it's important to understand what their baseline is. Uh, and uh, just because they don't know who the president is doesn't mean they ever knew who the president was. It's graded in various degrees based upon whether you have loss of consciousness and whether you have amnesia. And uh, if you have a simple mild concussion without a blackout and you do an exertional stress test, have them run up and down the sidelines and then test them periodically with some questions uh, like numbers or months backwards, etc., then they can return to play when they're asymptomatic. If they have con confusion and amnesia, uh, and this makes a grade two injury, then you need to wait a week for them to return. If they have loss of consciousness, particularly for a long, prolonged period, then you need to hold off, get a CT scan, and they're probably going to be out a month. You should not allow a player return to play if they have loss of consciousness, if they have symptoms more than 15 minutes, if their symptoms recur after exertion, if, especially if they have retrograde amnesia, or if they've had prior concussions. Now there's a so-called SAC test that you carry a little card around in your wallet and that reminds you what to ask. And these focus on orientation, memory, concentration, exertional stress testing, and then delayed recall. You can also do neuropsych testing, which is done in a lot of universities now. And that's just coming along, so it's not testable for the boards. Memory testing, part of evaluation, uh, and as are some of these other things. More often than not, the CT or the MRI is normal, but you want to make sure you don't have an epidural bleed. So concerns, bleeding. Second, impact syndrome. What does that mean? Well, if you let somebody go back to play and they're still symptomatic, they have a high risk for mortality, which is not good for your uh, license. In fact, uh, this uh, comes right out of the NCAA manual several years ago. Individual sustains a second, often minor blow to the head before initial symptoms are over. There's an approximately 50% mortality rate with second impact syndrome. So certainly not in your best interest to allow your high school quarterback to go back in the field if he's still symptomatic. Uh, how about cervical spine injuries? Well, commonly occurs is axial load. That's why there's big, big emphasis on tackling techniques, teaching people to keep their face up while they're tackling. Uh, and uh, if they were to get an injury, then you leave their helmets and pads on the field and immobilize them for transportation. That's the key testable thing. And I've covered high school games where people have, uh, this is exactly what happened, and we saved the guy's life literally by not allowing them to take their, their pads off because they had a C2 fracture with significant instability. Burners and stingers, dead arm syndrome, that can occur either from a traction or compression injury of the brachial plexus. Uh, these can evolve, and you can have all kinds of problems. Uh, severe ones include transient quadriplegia or obviously more severe than that is permanent quadriplegia. So if you have a patient who has uh, numbness, weakness, burning, then by all means be conservative in their management and, and, uh, and transport them. Don't allow them to return to the game until they're with burners, maybe if their symptoms go away. Cervical stenosis, this Pavlov ratio A to B uh, should be less than 0.8, but it's really not uh, classic. It's, it's technique dependent and it hasn't been predictive. So more importantly, you need to look at lateral radiographs and look at whether they have stenosis, acquired stenosis, arthritis, and those often associated with a phenomenon called spear tackler spine, where the kids just go crazy, don't listen to their coaches, don't do the right technique, get developmental stenosis and uh, changes in their cervical spine x-rays. Those patients should be let go of the team, should find another sport, should not play football. 
Uh, and so functional stenosis really is the new concept we're looking at as a space available for the court. And you take, take into account all these factors and consider with your uh, neurosurgeon what to do about each individual player. Again, burners and stingers, a self-limited uh, 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 brachial plexopathy. It gets away quickly, resolves quickly. If the patient has recurrent burners, then you need to look into this, get lateral C-spine radiographs, consider different uh, colors, uh, and see if you can figure out a way to keep that from happening. Some guys get the burners and you can't figure out what to do with them ever, and it's a dilemma. But uh, uh, at that point, you need to get your neurosurgery colleagues involved. So you shouldn't allow the patient to return to play if they have transient quadriplegia, especially with severe stenosis, uh, cervical neuropraxia with ligaments instability, congenital anomalies with failure of formation. And so these are all classic long-term uh, contraindications to return to play. How about low back pain? Well, low back pain uh, in adolescence is important to know that you have a paucity of symptoms, so you may only have a straight leg raise. That's why an MRI is helpful in that group to figure it out. How about PARS defects, spondylolysis? Uh, well, you can get a bone scan to help make the diagnosis, but the CT scan is the most sensitive uh, at one level to see how it's healing. And so that's the important here is the different examination techniques, CT scan being more accurate at that level. If you have a grade one or two slip, less than 50%, you can allow that patient to return to play if they're asymptomatic. If they have a grade three or four slip, that's a contraindication to return to play to contact sports. So let's do some uh, head and spine questions real quick. Wrong answers, removing the helmet and shoulder plaids, early return to play for a second burner, you need to get a cervical spine lateral radiograph, MRI for spondylysis, not helpful. You need to get a CT scan. Uh, number one, football player, neck injury, spine board, what should we do? Leave the shoulder pads and helmet in place. Uh, in fact, you should cut off the face mask, and there are special tools your trainer has for that that he carries around. Uh, and you should immobilize the neck on that board with uh, tape and towels. 22-year-old man burning from the supraclavicular area to the tips of fingers. He's got a burner. He's had twice in a previous game before, uh, and therefore he has recurrent burners. He's already had it twice. He's got it again. It's only, and what do you do about that? Well, you need to get the lateral radiographs and check it out before you let him go because he may have uh, a uh, bad stenosis or he may have spiritacular spine. Five, 15-year-old dancer, back pain. Uh, spondylolysis very likely, and there it is, no spondylolisthesis. What do we do about that? Spondylolysis without spondylolisthesis and a dancer? Well, we just try to limit their dancing for a while, see if we can treat them conservatively. Certainly don't need any surgery uh, at that point. Seven, uh, how do we look at the healing of a spondylolytic lesion? Okay, we already identified the lesion. We want to know how it's healing at a specific test at a specific level, and that would be a CT scan. All right, so those are the head and spine. Let's move quickly on to team physician. Uh, several issues in the training room include privacy issues, uh, and uh, you cannot allow your trainer to give out drugs, and uh, you really need to be concerned about a lot of other things other than just musculoskeletal care of your athletes. Pre-participation uh, physical should be done in, in all athletes, particularly freshmen who come in, and you use, use an orthopedic questionnaire because you get more information out of that than you would from your exam. If you happen to be so lucky as to catch a murmur, then you recognize that if they have a uh, murmur that increases with Valsalva maneuver, then that you need to have further worked up because there's an outflow obstruction. Now, more likely than not, this is the answer on the test question, but you're not likely to hear this murmur because you're an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, certainly, red flags on pre-participation examination includes exertional dizziness, murmurs, transient quadriplegia in the past, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Heat illness. The key here is to drink fluids and uh, to monitor the weight and urine output. And there's various degrees of uh, heat stroke. The worst is heat stroke, of course, and that's an emergency. If you have heat stroke, you need to get these guys involved and cool them down. Physically challenged uh, athletes, uh, the, for example, with Down syndrome, 
You need to recognize that they have uh, thermoregulatory problems. Spinal cord injury is also thermoregulatory problems, and uh, be aware of that. Frostbite, rewarm, and warm baths. Uh, drugs, uh, this is a common problem uh, in uh, all areas, and so they're getting more and more sophisticated with not only the testing, but with the drugs. And so a lot of times the athletes try to stay one step ahead of to our testing. Recognize the side effects, for example, with steroids, testicular atrophy, alopecia. Those are uh, irreversible. You can also have cardiac problems. Growth hormone, you can have hypertension and gigantism. Creatine, used very commonly in high school populations. Uh, this can cause some cramping or hydration problems. Supplement use, uh, the use pattern is continue to rising, uh, and you need to make sure you know what your athletes are using. Try to look at the bottle yourself. The, the, probably the biggest offender here is some of these energy drinks, which you have to be careful about hydration and, and cause an increased uh, uh, heart rate and uh, sometimes, unfortunately, death. Creatine, we talked about this, uh, cramps, increased muscle injury, rarely renal insufficiency. Uh, the better uh, administration of this is to try to taper this off before the actual season. Stimulants, uh, these may have a hidden component as we indicated. Dehydration is a problem, uh, and then you need to look at the bottle and make sure that uh, you're safe in taking those. These things like ephedra, ephedrine, ma hung, you've got to be careful of those. Those, can, those, can, uh, those have been implicated in bad problems in athletes. Glucosamine chondroitin sulfate recommended for people with uh, arthritis or cartilage problems. Uh, you need to take uh, 1,500 milligrams a day of this for several months. There's been several studies showing that there's some benefit in selected problems. The problem is there's very little regulation, and so you need to make sure what the components are, the, the condition, and the treatment you're taking. Hyalgan, Synvisc really uh, haven't justified their use. Uh, one study showed they're no better than steroid. And uh, at most, they have a transitory benefit of three to six months. Steroid injections never recommend uh, injecting into tendons. They can cause skin change, and they elevate the glucose level in diabetics. That last fact is commonly tested on questions. How about growth factor engineering? Well, that's the future. We'll see how that goes, not in the test. Uh, what is in the test, though, is exercise. Isometric, you don't change the link in the, mus in the muscle. Isotonic, there's constant resistance. Isokinetic, constant velocity. Plyometric, uh, becoming important for our female athletes, uh, which allows rapid shortening eccentric concentric uh, studies. Weight training can increase mitochondria and capsular density, will allow thickening of connective tissue. Make sure you understand this concept of aerobic versus anaerobic. Anaerobic involves short sprints with type 2 muscles, aerobic, longer term oxidative slow red ox muscles, uh, and then there's somewhere in between the glycolytic pathway, which uh, causes lactic acidosis after a few minutes of heavy exertion. Plyometrics, good for sports with explosive power, uh, can, can be beneficial. Muscle soreness follows intense exercise, peaks at about 24 to 48 hours. I'm sure we're all familiar with this. It's caused by edema and inflammation and can increase your uh, creatine kinase levels. Muscle atrophy from disuse, fatty infiltration, and we're familiar with that uh, with uh, rotator cuff disease. Uh, this occurs more commonly in muscles crossing a single joint. Rehab, uh, in the early rehab, ice therapy has been shown to be beneficial, uh, and uh, the phases of rehab should be acute recovery and functional phases as we return to sports. Aging as opposed to arthritis, Increased water content in the articular cartilage, increased collagen cross-linking in the tendons, and exercise uh, increases the fat-free mass, what's beneficial of, of exercise in the aging population. Prophylactic knee braces, no uh, benefit for cruciates, may have some risk of reduction of MCL injuries in interior linemen and linebackers. Training room, viral infections, be aware there's a whole host of problems. Hopefully your medicine colleague can take care of those. Uh, every once in a while you hear reports of meningitis in this population, and if it's a bacterial meningitis, you have to do a CSF evaluation. Mono occurs in, uh, in uh, training rooms as well. You need to be able to uh, make sure that you worry about the concept of splenomegaly and don't allow them to return to contact sports during the problem, during when they've, uh, the three to five weeks uh, after they have onset of mono because that's when they're most at risk for rupturing your spleen. 
Skin infections commonly ask about herpes uh, in the wrestlers, and uh, so there's a whole host of antivirals used these days. The bottom line is you've got to make sure that you have your lesions scabbed over uh, and you're taking these, these, these medications that need to be scabbed over for 48 hours or you can't return uh, to wrestling. Same sort of thing with impetigo. The lesions need to be all cleared. Uh, these are treated with local antibiotics and, uh, and oral antibiotics. HIV, we've talked about. The bottom line, the testing thing for HIV is that you cannot uh, discriminate against HIV athletes. Hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy can occur in young patients, very common cause of death. Coronary artery disease, the killer in patients over 35 to 40. Comatocortis, blow a baseball or a hockey stick to the chest. Uh, there's very little you can do when that happens because it, it is often fatal, despite having immediate resuscitation. What about asthma? Well, asthma has coughing, shortness of breath, and wheezing from drying and cooling of the mucosa. That's why it's worse in winter sports. Uh, and you're treated with beta agonist or steroid inhalers. Blunt injury, the most common uh, organ involved is the kidney because you've got two of them. Spleen is second, and it's often implicated in football. Uh, the classic test question about you going out to the field and somebody's having extreme difficulty breathing, uh, then you pull out your handy uh, interthoracic needle and stick it in, and you relieve a tension pneumothorax. Kidney injury can cause uh, hematuria. Uh, excessive bleeding needs to uh, get to your urologist right away. Eye injuries occurs very commonly in young athletes. Uh, obviously, you need eye protection if you can, and that's why prevention is key. Uh, and significant eye injuries involves vision loss, decreased acuity, bright flashes of light, uh, sudden increase in floaters and all these other things you see here. Uh, traumatic myodriasis, uh, contusion of the iris, uh, temporary dilated pupil, corneal abrasions as you see very commonly, you simply put antibiotics and a patch on it. Ear injuries, cauliflower ear, very common in wrestlers. You can aspirate these and wrap them. Dental injuries, try to save the tooth or replace it immediately, or at least put it in the mouth to have them not swallow it though. Uh, testicular injuries, uh, uh, the ultrasound uh, for urologists can be helpful in, in determining how bad this injury is. Pudendal nerve neuropraxia shows up on tests also. Uh, you can have penile shaft, uh, shaft numbness, uh, and uh, that's suboptimal. Therefore, you should uh, modify the seat uh, whenever possible. Uh, paired organs, the key test question here is this is according to the Disability Act. You cannot tell an athlete they can't play because they only have one kidney or one testicle or one eye. And so that's the Disability Act. Female athlete triad, we're all aware of this menstrual dysfunction, disordered eating, bone mineral uh, osteopenia. And so the key here is to make sure they have good nutrition and often the birth control pills are appropriate. Uh, Title IX means that female athletes have equal access to training rooms, et cetera. You'd be aware of that as you go uh, take care of teams. Uh, some other minor issues that uh, come up with a female athlete is the uh, pregnancy, increasing the estradiol, which can lead to ligament laxity, uh, bone loss after menopause, and probably the most common thing we're seeing more and more of is a female athlete at risk with pivoting sports, and the way you avoid this is jump training to reduce the incidence of ACL injuries. Stress fractures, we've talked about uh, ad nauseum. Recognize some of the common locations for this. MRI is largely supplanting bone scan in the identification of stress fractures. We're almost done. So wrong answers for team physician, isometric exercise, delay uh, uh, diagnosis or treatment uh, of the on-field injury. Number one, eccentric isotonic muscle contraction. Uh, undergoes which of the following processes. Eccentric means it lengthens. Isotonic means it's constant resistance. Number three, rehabilitative exercise where the foot is mobile and motion of the knee is independent of the hip and ankle. Open chain, as opposed to closed chain where you have some, something on the foot such as a stationary cycle. Five, cover football game, Labored respirations, the thin neck vein, cyanosis, tension pneumothorax. You just pull out that, that IV needle you got and go for it. And that uh, is conclusion of the uh, sports lecture. Thank you very much.
So we need to uh, have you pass in 